Yes, the final is based off of about 50, and it's going to be about 100 questions. So about 50 of those questions are going to come directly from the first three exams, like not reworded, just directly copy and pasted from the first three exams. And the other 50 questions are going to come from the last portions of the, the exam, of chapters we do, and study guides. Or more specifically, the study guides of these chapters we're about to start today. Okay, so to understand that, the first three tests we took will be on there, and then the end chapters, like chapter 11, therefore, get the study guides, right? Yep. And this is why, well, among, amongst other reasons, that I recommend people do what you've done, which is meet me. Talk about the old exams, like here's the questions you got wrong, here's why it's wrong, here's how you can remember this is the correct answer, because you're going to see those questions again on the final. For you, that's the purpose. For me, I want to teach you biology. And I think the final will be easier than the other test. Probably, yeah, because half of Because I can I memorize it. Exactly. I was the same way as a student, which is why I do, do it like this as a teacher. I could, I could, you could give me a study guide for a course I've never had mm -hmm. right now, and I bet I can at least get an A or a B on it multiple choices yeah, I can memorize stuff. Doesn't mean I learned it, but I, I can memorize like a champ. But that's why I hate exams. Right, so but you really I, can't do that for your other three tests because I studied the study guides. Like if you gave it to me, I would have got an A or B from the right. study guides. Because mm -hmm. the way you do it, you want us to apply what you teach. Exactly. Yeah. And it's different from memorizing it. Yes it is. That's why I like 108 so much for the online courses. I thought it was easier. Yeah, the, the exams were, but to me, those the, the real learning, the real thing was the discussions. You know, those were 25 points a piece, so that's 50 points every two weeks. So it wasn't worth as much as the exams as far as points are concerned. But that was where they were worth a lot, and you really had to understand. You had to understand what you were saying to do it. You know, you really had to really apply your knowledge instead of just memorize stuff. It is what it is, you know. I almost wish that almost wish there were no grades and almost wish there were no exams, but some people need that. You know, otherwise they're not gonna study, they're not gonna learn. So we'll be done with everything before break, pretty much, other than lab makeup, right? In the final. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that last week after break, we probably will be covering material. This chapter, these late, these later chapters are getting their information thick, so to speak. So they're, they're a little bit longer. So it might take us that long to get through some of these. But it would be nice if we were just completely done and we could just have reviews. Because I know all the labs will be done before Thanksgiving other than the makeup lab. Yep. And the makeup lab is going to be all on you guys. Technically, you could just say, I'm, I got perfect on this lab, so count it twice, and I'll do that. But the idea is for someone to choose the worst lab and fix it, but I'll let, them, I'll let the student decide. I've got about a minute left, so I'm going to start a sentence. Bryant is here. 
Curry, Darby, Fisher, Hamilton is online, Hellman is online, Ashley is here, Crystal is here, Taylor is online, Chase, Rollins, Saunders is online, Shamblin is here, and Vargas. All right, well, still not eight yet, so we'll wait a little bit. And once it's eight, I'll start the announcements. Okay, that's eight. Um, so for the first announcement, uh, independent work is officially over, right? So you should have 100 points of independent work by now. 100 points out of the entire class. The entire class is worth 1,000 points, so that's a full letter grade. It's meant to be to help you, because I hear all the time, I'm not good at testing, I'm not good at science, I'm not good at biology. Well, that was meant for me, just 100 points that you had complete control over that you could have gotten. That being said, I will no longer officially accept written work, um, so you can still do the videos, still do the stu study guides, some of you have been bringing in the cans, right? You can do that. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff. So if you have questions about that, because I had a good someone asked me yesterday about it. So if you have questions about what other things you could do to um, earn your independent work points, let me know or look at the syllabus or look at my own announcements or look at the Facebook group. There's all, all kinds of ways. And if you have an idea of something you can do, like, hey, can I do this for independent work? Then run by me and um, we might do it. So that's the official answer. Unofficially, if you turn in papers, I'll still accept them. I'm just telling you I might not be able to grade them. So you, I don't know how to explain this, but I give them a really long conversation. Every time someone turns something in, I get an email, right? So I go through my emails, and I return emails, and I grade things in the order in which they were received, right? That's like my priority list. Um, so when you do this, if you turn something in, you're basically going to be the bottom of my priority list. So I'm going to cover new stuff constantly. And then if I'm done with new stuff, then I'll go back and grade anything you've turned in. Does that make sense? So I'm saying, unofficially, you can still turn in written work. Um, and I might grade it, and I promise you I'll try my best to. But again, you're at the bottom of the priority list. And there's a possibility if you turn something in, turn in written work, I might not grade it. And that's especially true, because I know, I don't know who, but it always happens. So at least one of you is going to turn a bunch of things in on the last week of the class. And I'm telling you now, I'm not going to have time to grade it. And then you're going to get upset and say, why did I do all this work? I'm telling you now, all that stuff's past due. If you do it, I'm going to do my best to grade it, but I can't guarantee that I'm going to grade it. And the earlier you do it, the more likely it is that I'll be able to grade it, right? So if you turn a bunch of stuff in today, as opposed to the last Friday of class, this is going to be more chance that I'll, I'll grade it. Any questions about independent work? And again, there's stuff out there, so if you need... If you need my help finding it, let me know. I'll show you all the stuff I'm talking about, all the videos and stuff. All right, the other thing is exams. So now that we've done exam three, it is officially, again, officially too late to retake the second exam. I have that rule because now that we, now that it's too late to take the second exam, retake the second exam, I will now meet with any of you that you want and sit down and talk to you about your exam. Here's what you got wrong. This is why that answer was wrong. Here's how it was, here's the correct answer. Here's why it's correct. Here's how you can remember it, because you're probably going to see this on the on the final exam, right? I can do all that for you. It'll help you prepare for the final exam. And in addition, I'll give you a 5% boost to your grade. And this still goes for the first exam, too. If you sit down and get feedback on anything, I will give you a 5% boost to that grade for sitting down with me and getting that feedback for labs, exams, all that stuff. <clears throat> that being said, again, that's the official word. Um, and somebody has scheduled to talk to me about the first, uh, the second exam. But until I talk to that person about the second exam, unofficially you can still retake the second exam. The thing is, I don't want, I'm not gonna let anybody retake the second exam after I've given away all the correct answers. So unofficially, you can still retake the second exam. Speaking of exams, all right, third exam. As you saw, you saw the announcement. Generally speaking, people who get C's and above's did very well. They did better than they usually do. And generally speaking, people who get D's and blows did worse than they usually do. 
Um, so because of that, as I'm sure you've seen the announcement, you can retake the third exam too. However, this isn't going to be like other re -exam, the other retakes. This is going to be a legitimate retaking of the second or third exam. So we'll meet online. You're going to need to share your camera with, you know, have your camera on, share your screen, have your microphone on because it's a closed book exam. Um, yeah, and you can retake it that way. So one at a time, one on one, that's how you're going to retake the third exam. And this time, it won't be an average, right? So last time, if you scored a 50 on your first exam and a 100 on your second attempt, then you would average it out and have a 75. This time, if you scored a 50 on your first attempt and a 100 on your second attempt, then your second attempt, that's going to be your grade. 100 will be your grade. Does that make sense? It's not going to be an average. <laughs> that being said, probably even after this retake, there'll probably be yet another retake that I'll let you do that's like the retakes that we've already done, but we'll see. We'll cross that bridge. So anyway, yeah, contact me. And I've looked at my emails, I've glanced over them, I haven't checked them, but I have seen a few of you have already contacted me trying to schedule a time to retake the third exam, so that's perfect. So I highly recommend doing it. You have nothing to lose. Even if you get a lower grade, on your, re, your retake, um, we'll just keep your first original higher grade. So any questions about exams? All right, that's it. Now let's jump into the next portion, the last portion of the of the semester, right? This is the last three chapters, maybe four, I'll explain that in a second, that's going to be on the final exam. And as someone mentioned earlier and was recorded earlier in this video, the final exam is gonna be about 100 questions. About 50 of them are gonna come directly from the first three exams, like not reworded. It's completely copied and pasted from the first three exams. And the other, about 50 questions, is gonna come from what we're starting right now. Um, and it's gonna come from the study guides, reworded as, as you're used to seeing. And to me, this is really exciting because everything we've done so far up until today has been looking at cells, right? Like what are the chromosomes doing? What are the chloroplasts doing? What are the mitochondria doing? Which is fun enough, but for me, this is the exciting stuff. So finally, to me, or we're, we're finally talking about organisms, right? We're no longer looking at cells, we're looking at the big picture. This is my favorite stuff. But I want to point this out before we move forward. So we're covering chapter 11, um, and I'm still going to base this off the old textbook because I think the old textbook teaches it better. You're still going to learn the same information, and I'm just going to do it in a slightly different order. Um, and your old textbook combines this chapter with your chapter 12. So what I've done is I've done the same thing, right? So when we do this PowerPoint, when we have this discussion, I'm also going to have chapter 12 mixed in with chapter 11. And if you look at the WVSU online, you'll see there's a whole separate PowerPoint and a whole separate um, study guide for Chapter 12. But I'm not sure I'm going to do that. I'm going to play that by ear. Most likely, we're going to officially skip Chapter 12 because I'm going to put parts of it into this, and that'll be that. Any questions? Okay, finally, let's jump into it. Fun stuff, I think. All right, so yes, we're talking about evolution. And let me say this too before, before I jump into this, because your book doesn't really emphasize it that much, and the old textbook doesn't emphasize it that much, and a lot of teachers don't emphasize it that much. Before I get into this, I want to emphasize one thing. There's evolution, it's how populations change, right? Like you guys saw the, the peppered moss, right? So they used to be mostly light colored, right? They consisted of mostly light colored moths. Then over time, there was mostly dark colored moths. So that's what evolution is. It's, the change of a population. Now, there's different types of evolution. And you're going to learn all this. I'm going to say this all officially with the words on the screen later. There's natural selection. There's genetic drift. There's all these things I'm going to teach you. But I just want to make, make this very clear. There's different types of evolution. So natural selection is not the, it's the big one that we talk the most about. But it's not the only way that things evolve. So just keep that in the back of your mind when we talk about this. Evolution and natural selection are not the same words, right? Natural selection is just a type of evolution. Um, speaking of words, let's say the first word for attendance will be clock. So for those of you who are here in person, you can send me those words afterwards if you want correction credit. For those of you who are online watching currently live, you need to send the word clock um, within five minutes of the lecture and to get your attendance points. And if you're watching a video, um, take a screenshot of me pointing at the word clock and send the word clock, right? So we're going back to screenshots for those of you who are watching the video. Gotta keep you on your toes. 
All right, this picture is from your old textbook. I won't get into it too much because I'm running a little bit behind. But like I said, there's different types of evolution. So the, your old textbook was kind of pointing that fact out. That, did anybody tell what that is? Probably tomato. not. Yeah, it's a tomato, right? And I like that you book, I mean, it's probably cherry tomato. But tomatoes used to be that big, not just cherry, cherry tomatoes. All tomatoes used to be that big, but humans changed it. That's called artificial selection. That's a type of evolution. So it's, again, uh, there's so many different types of evolution. Evolution isn't all about like, oh, we came from monkeys, which we do. Uh, but people always say that, I don't believe in evolution. But if you ate a tomato, you're eating the process, <laughs> the product of evolution. Um, this is cheetahs. We'll talk a little bit about cheetahs later. There's something called the bottleneck effect. So cheetahs almost went extinct twice, and because of that, their genetics are all messed up. We'll, we'll discuss that later. Not that that's important, but it's a good example of something called the bottleneck. This kid scratching his head because he has head lice. Um, in your old textbook, the point they were getting at was pesticide resistance. So, you know, when you apply pesticides to a population of pests, it kills most of them. But somehow, sometimes some of them survive because there's something in their genes that makes them immune to whatever pesticide that you apply to them. And those survivors are gonna go on and they're gonna reproduce, so therefore the new population of pests are gonna be all resistant to the pesticide because you killed all the weak ones, so to speak. Anyway, and that's all stuff that we're gonna talk about in this chapter. So again, here's the chapter overview. This is the way I'm gonna teach it. This is gonna be slightly out of order from the way your textbook teaches it, but I think that's even better. Because I'm gonna teach it one way, and hopefully that'll make sense to you. And if not, you can read the textbook. The information is the same, but the order in which I'm giving it to you and the, the, some of the examples might be a little bit different. And again, what we're doing is, or what I'm doing, I'm going to squeeze chapter 12 in right here at the beginning because we're going to talk about the diversity of life before we talk about how we have the diversity of life, which is what evolution is, right? That's how we have the diversity. But here we go. The diversity of life. Chapter 12. Kind of sounds weird when we're starting with 12 and then jumping back into 11. First of all, you need to know what taxonomy is. Taxonomy is the branch of biology that deals with identifying, naming, and classifying species. That's what taxonomy is. And there's a whole class on this. Like if you're a biology major, that is one of your electives. You can take a whole class, a whole semester on taxonomy. We use something called the Linnaean system. I'm not going to ask you what the Linnaean system is, but you need to be familiar with it. It is a method of naming species. And also, it's a method, method of categorizing them, right? So, does anybody, I don't expect anybody to know this right off the bat yet. Not that I'm going to ask you, but does anybody know what, for example, what, well, here's an easy one. What kingdom are humans in? Speaking of classifications, does anybody know what kingdom we are in? Surely you know this. Someone knows it. You're just being shy. Are we in the plant kingdom? No. Are we in the fungi kingdom? So I'm going to guess. What? All right, we're in the animal kingdom, right? And under that, we're vertebrates, so on and so forth. Anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that. Hopefully you guys knew it. You were just too shy for some reason to say it. Yeah, we're all animals. Anyway, let's talk about it. Naming and classifying the diversity of life. So for the Linnaean system, the species is given a two-part Latinized name or we call also call that a binomial. I'm not going to ask you what a binomial is. But the first part is the genus, and the second part is the species. Now, again, like I said, officially it's too late to write independent work, um, but unofficially you can still turn in some papers. And some of you have done this. I have not taken off points because I haven't taught it yet. But when you write um, a species name, the first part, again, is the genus. The second part is the species. The first part is capitalized like this. The second part is not capitalized, and they're both supposed to be in italics. So moving forward, if you write a species name, do it the correct way, or you'll lose a point. But your old textbook uses this example. Um, there's a genus of large cats called Panthera, right? That's the genus, and then within that genus, there's different species. So the two part names together is the species name. The scientific name for a leopard is Panthera partis. I'm gonna put it next to that, just as a visual indication that I'm not going to ask you to memorize that example. It's just an example. I'm not going to ask you to memorize any scientific names, including homo sapiens, right? Us. I'm not going to ask you to understand or memorize any scientific names. You just need to understand that when you see a scientific name like this, the first part is the genus and the second part is the uh, species. Speaking of which, 
And speaking of independent work, if you were to look it up, you know, our um, scientific name is Homo sapiens, right? So Homo is the genus, sapiens is the um, species. So what are some other species in that genus? The Homo, right? What are, obviously we're not the only species, so what are the other species? You can look that up for independent work if you want. Um, so anyway, you might be wondering why. Like, why do we do this, right? The scientific name for leopard is Panthera pardis. Why not just call it a leopard, right? Why make it more difficult? And oh, I hope this didn't download the wrong one. Let me see. Ah, it did. Never mind. So I was going to ask you what this thing is. I'll block it. Um, so actually, did would anybody ever been able to recognize that? Would any of you guys recognize that? I mean, I know it's there, but you recognize it, right? So where I grew up in the Keys, we used to call that dolphin. And even back in the day, even on the menu, it would say dolphin. Of course, that confused the tourists because they would think flipper, like, oh, that's horrible. You guys are eating dolphins. But anyway, there's other names for it, right? So you probably recognize it as Mahi Mahi. You know, if you go to the restaurants, that's what usually what you see on the menu these days. Um, if you're in Spanish-speaking countries, it's usually called Dorado. If you're in Japan, um, it's called Chira. So again, the point is, we have all of these different common names for the same species, and that's why we have scientific names, right? It's because it gets rid of ambiguity, right? So around the world, this fish is called many different things, but all scientists call it the same thing. And that's the reason why we do this. It's not just to make uh, life difficult for biology students. Now, as far as the exam is concerned, this next slide is the most important. Probably also the more uh, complicated, too. So you need to know the, the, the order in which things go, right? So if you're going to mower specific to least specific, like we already said, there's a specific genus. Within genus, within that, we're all lumped into the same genera which is uh, plural for genus, right? And then above that, we have orders. Above that, we have classes. Above that, we have phyla or phylum. Above that, we have kingdoms. And above that, we have domains. So we're going here from more specific to less specific. And let me just show you this slide. This is better, and we'll leave it at that. So if you're studying, I recommend studying this. You need to know this in this order, back and forth. So going from more specific to less, or less specific to more specific, we would say domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. You need to know that in that sort. There will be a question on the exam where I give you some name of something and you need to tell me, you need to figure out, you know, what I'm talking about based on knowing this order. Of course, this is just an example, so you don't need to memorize the fact that these uh, leopards are in the uh, eukaryote domain and the animal kingdom, and the chordate phylum, and the mammal class, and the carnivora order, Felidae family, Panthera genus. You don't need to memorize those. Those are just um, just an example. But you need to know this order back and forth. So, any questions about that? And again, unofficially, for independent work, if you want to write a paper, pick your favorite thing, your favorite living organism, and just tell me what it is. Classify it. Right? If your favorite thing is a rose, you know. You tell them you could look it up and say, all right, the domain is eukarya, the kingdom is plant, phylum is angiosperm, whatever, right? You can look it up and just tell me. Any questions about this? That picture is not from your textbook, neither is this one. This one's from a different textbook. But it's the same thing, just visualize different, right? So here we're going, again, from more broad to more specific. So you, uh, domain, kingdom, phylum, class. Oops. This one says subphylum. Yeah. Don't worry about the subphylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Which brings up another good point, actually, that I should bring up, I should mention this. Depending on your source, sometimes there are some in-between stuff, right? So this picture itself shows between phylum and class, there is something called a subphylum. And again, depending on your source, there might be a superclass or something like that. But for your purposes, what you need to know is domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And again, for independent work, if you want to look it up, you can think of some organism that you like and classify it. And, or you could compare it to humans, right? So again, if you're talking about, I don't know, if rose is, if, if rose is your favorite thing, you say, how closely are roses related to humans? Well, we're definitely not the same species or genus or family or order or class or phylum or kingdom, but we all, 
we're in the same domain as roses, right? We're both eukaryotes. Anyway, look that up if you want. Any questions about this slide? Here would be the next word for attendance. It's a whale. It's usual stuff, but again, if you're watching the video, not if you're live right now, but if you're watching the video later, you take a screenshot of me pointing at the whale and send that picture with the word whale. All right, so your book points out that the criteria to classify all these things is mo mostly arbitrary, right? So people just decided these things are related to those things because they have these things in common. At least it used to be. Um, I should put that point that out. Yeah, I should say the criteria used to be used to be very arbitrary, but now um, because of molecular biology and now that we can look at genes and things like that, then we can make it less arbitrary. And it's it's interesting. Your book doesn't really cover it, but there's something called phylogeny. And then again, this is one we talk about when we're looking at this relationship, but we're looking at it at the molecular level. And now that we're looking at things at the molecular level and looking at DNA, a lot of times things have changed. We say, oh, turns out this thing is not that closely related to that thing. This thing is actually more related to this other thing. And things have been changing um, in, in the class of, classifications of life because of the technology we have now. Anyway, if you download this PowerPoint, you can uh, click that link and it'll short, show you a short video about taxonomy. Moving forward, let's talk about this. A species, you need to know what a species is. Because moving forward, we're going to talk a lot about species. Um, you need to know what a species is. Later, you need to know what a population is. Because a species makes up a population. And then you need to know what a community is and all these things. So this is where we start. You need to know what a species is. It's a group of actually or potentially interbreeding individuals. So the way we define a species is if those organisms can breed with each other and produce fertile offspring, then we consider them a species. There are exceptions. You can look them up uh, for independent work if you want. But yeah, that's generally how we define a species. If they can breed together, produce fertile offspring, we consider them in the same species. The fertile part is important too because you know you can breed a donkey and a horse and make a mule, right? So you can breed that, but mules are fertile. You can produce uh, what a donkey and uh, what is a donkey? I think a donkey and a zebra. I forget the name of the what, what you call it, but yeah, those will have offspring, but again, they're not fertile. Or a liger, right? A tiger and a tiger and a lion. You can breed them, and you have a big old cat, um, but they, again, they're not fertile offspring. Very interesting if you want to look that up for independent work too, right? What are some of the things that you can make and have offspring that are not fertile? Or, if you really want to dig into it, what are the exceptions to this rule? What are two species that can interbreed and have fertile offspring? Not that you need to know it, which is why I'm not going to talk about it. Any questions about what a species is? All right, let's talk about speciation then. Now you've done the lab from last week, so you know that uh, natural selection, at least your website says, that, that website says, the natural selection is how new species evolve. And that is true, that is one of, the way, one of the ways it happens. But there's a word for that, and that is speciation. So you need to know that. Speciation is the formation of two species from one original species. So there's the original species and then you have new species that come off of it. Now that's your book definition. I don't actually like that definition because sometimes you can have one species, an ancestral species, and have another one kind of branch off from that, but then sometimes you can still keep that original um, ancestor species. So it's not like, it's not always where one species turns into two, right? Necessarily, right? Anyway, that's what speciation is. There's two different types of speciations. You need to know this. We're going to talk about them individually. There's allopatric and sympatric speciation. Allopatric is when there's a geographic separation, right? That's what caused it, because they were separated from each other. Then your book even gets even more detailed. Like under allopatric, there's something called dispersal and vicariance. But I'm going to put an X to that, let you know that you don't need to know the difference between the two. You can read about it in the textbook if you want, but I'm not going to ask you about it. I'm not even really talk about it much. 
But yeah, allopatric speciation is when there's they've been set, separated from each other geographically, and then there's sympatric speciation, which is where they're basically together geographically. And that's the first thing you need to know before we before I give you some details about each one of them. So any questions so far? All right, so let's talk about allopatric um, speciation. Here's an example. This is a hypothetical example. I made it up. This is not real. I mean, probably dig in. This probably, this probably has happened. Um, this is not your textbook. Your textbook gives one example. You can read about it. I never test you on examples, whether it's the textbook example or my example. Um, I don't know if you guys have, oh, it's hard to see. I don't know if you're very familiar with the Pacific Northwest, but you know, here's the Pacific Ocean. And there's the coast, right? So there's Washington. Actually, it is really hard to see. That stinks. Anyway, there's Washington, Seattle, that area, right? The Puget Sound. And there's a huge mountain range. And what happens is, actually, when you guys think of Seattle weather-wise, what do you guys think of? Not that I expect anyone to know, but usually someone knows. Like, when you think of Seattle, do you have any kind of weather stereotypes? Say cold and rainy. Yeah, rainy, right? At least rainy. It's got, to me, that was always a stereotype, even before I'd ever been there or learned anything about it. Yeah, it's really rainy. And the reason it's really rainy, not that you need to know this, but this is just an example. What's happened is the Pacific plate, which we can't see because it's under the ocean, is hitting the North American plate, and it's crashing, right? They're crashing together, and that's what's formed these mountains, right? And these are really, really tall mountains. So what happens is all this moisture and this weather comes in from the Pacific Ocean, and then it hits these mountains, and it can't make it over the mountains. So all that moisture that's in the air just dumps. It dumps on Seattle because it can't make it over the mountains. So likewise, as wet as Seattle is, on the other side of the mountains, it's very dry. Make sense? It's like a desert. The other side of uh, Washington is basically a desert. And that's why, because all that, dump, that moisture just gets dumped. Here's what I'm getting at. So imagine, like I said, those mountains were formed because the Pacific Plate is crashing into the North American Plate. So those mountains have not always been there. So imagine you had one species of plant that lived in all of Washington, right? Just one species of plant. And then one day, some mountain range started being formed. And then, you know, millions of years later, there was a full mountain range. So it used to be one species, right? So that one species is living on this really wet side, and then it's also living on the really dry side. And as you might imagine, with those different conditions, they're going to change, right? So the ones that live on the, the wet side probably um, are evolved to take advantage of that really wet um, situation, right? So, you know, some plants, for example, you can kill them if you water them too much. Likewise, there's some plants where if you don't water them enough, they'll die. So anyway, that's just my example, right? Imagine you just had this one species of plants. Then once this uh, mountain range sprung up between them, they're going to evolve differently, right? Because one of them's um, in this really wet situation, the other one's in a really dry situation. So eventually they're going to become different species because they're in just completely different um, uh, situations. Anyway, any questions about speciation, allopatric speciation? All right, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Your book also talks about something called adaptive radiation, and that is where a population of one species disperses throughout an area. Um, it's kind of like what I was talking about there. Your book gets into more details. What they're saying is, again, you have one species and then as they go to different areas geographically and face different situations, they're going to evolve to take uh, advantage of that. And that's how you get new species from one original species because they've radiated out from that one area. But I'm going to put it next to this just to let you know I'm not going to ask you any questions about adaptive radiation. Because that can be really um, complicated if you dig into it. Not that your textbook digs that deep into it. But. All right, so any questions about allopatric speciation? All right, I'm probably not going to talk much about sympatric speciation or ask many questions about it on the exam, but we'll talk about it very quickly here. So again, allopatric speciation, which is what we just got finished talking about, that's when there is a geographical separation, right? Sympatric speciation is when they're in the same area. So then you have to be, you might wonder, well, how does that happen? And your book basically points out it's usually due to chromosomal errors during meiosis. So we've already learned about meiosis. You've already learned that sometimes things don't separate the way they should. So things could have extra chromosomes or things could have fewer chromosomes. Usually that'll end up killing the organism, but not always. 
and in that case, that might make a new species, right? So there's something called polyploidy, and we mentioned it when we talked about this, right? So again, when you have extra uh, chromosomes, usually it's bad, especially with humans. We know it's always bad for humans to have extra chromosomes, but in some situations in nature, sometimes it's not necessarily bad. Sometimes it'll just form a new species. So that's how it can happen um, when they're in the same geographic area, which again, sympatric speciation. So any questions about that? Again, like I said, I'm probably not going to ask you any questions about this in Patrick. When I say probably, I might, but I haven't decided yet. Uh, your book gives this example. Um, it's a really bad example, in my opinion, but I'll go ahead and throw it out there. That way, when you read it, you'll know what I'm talking about. So these are two different fish, um, two different species of fish that came from one original species of fish, and they're in the same lake. So I guess by definition, it's St. Patrick speciation because they're in the same lake. So geographically, they're not isolated. But then your book goes on to talk about how, you know, they're fighting for food or they're competing for food. Um, and some of them happen to have, you know, uh, the ability to eat different types of food. So because of that, they did eat the different types of food. And those different types of food were found deeper in the lake. So what happened was you had this original species. Some of them stayed up in the shallow parts. Some of them went to the deeper parts. And eventually, because they were separated so long and not interbreeding with each other, they became different species. Um, but I think it's a bad example because, yes, you could argue that they are in the same geographic area because they're in the same lake. But really, like I said, some of them stayed in the shallow areas, some of them went to the deeper areas. So they are in different areas. They're in different environments. Whether they're in the same lake or not, they're in different environments. But anyway, that's just the, the book example. You don't need to know anything about that. Whew. We're almost there. Now, let's jump into the good stuff, in my opinion. Explaining the diversity of life. So now that we're done talking about chapter 12, talking about the diversity of life, let's talk about where this diversity came from. And your textbook and your old textbook both kind of tell it like a story. Uh, and I'm going to do the same thing, sort of like when we talked about genetics, right? We talked about Mendel. You know, Mendel did this in the pea garden, he did that, and you learned all the history. Same thing with uh, the DNA, right? When we talked about uh, Watson and Crick and how they discovered it. I'm going to do the same thing here. So I'm going to tell you the story of how we came to know what we know. But I'm not necessarily going to ask you many questions about the history of it, right? Because this is not a history class. Keep that in mind as we move forward. The explanation of the origin of the diversity of life is what is, comes from the evolutionary theory. So this is why it's so important. It was proposed by Charles Darwin in his book called On the Origins of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And that book was published in 1859. But Charles Darwin was not the first person to try to explain um, speciation or explain the origins of life or explain um, the diversity of life. Or before, and I'll put a big old X to this because I'm not going to ask you, no, that's going to be a question. Again, this is just an introduction, telling you what we used to know and how we came to know what we know today. So let's talk about the idea of a fixed species. It's interesting. Your old textbook talks about Aristotle. The textbook you guys are using talks about Plato. Apparently the Greeks basically got it wrong. But back in the day, that's what they thought, right? Species are fixed permanent forms is what they used to think. Like every species they saw on Earth it was always like that, and there's been no changes, right? That's what they thought. They thought there had been no change over time. This is also similar in the Judeo-Christian culture, right? So if you were to read the, the Bible literally, it just says, or depending on how, people, how you interpret it, says things were created this way. That's the way it's the way it is, right? There's been no change. Um, and if you were to click this icon or this icon, you can read both, you know, or watch little videos about both of them. Short videos that talk about uh, their view of the origins of life. Anyway, both of these tell the story of each form of life being individually created in the present day form, right? So again, depending on how you interpret it, that's what they thought, right? Things were made this way. They have not changed, and they will not change. Um, and also, and I don't think this is from your current textbook, this is from the old textbook, and again, I'm just giving you the story, the evolution, if you will, of how we come, came to know about evolution. In the 1600s, religious scholars estimated that the Earth was about 6,000 years old. In fact, some people maintain today that the Earth is about 6,000 years old. Um, they also maintain, especially back then, the idea that all living species came into being relatively recently, right, within that 6,000 years. 
and they're unchanging, and that has dominated for centuries. And again, some people still believe that, and I'm not here to make you not believe it if you believe that. Meanwhile, at the same time, right, even back then, back in the 1600s, people were finding fossils, right? And there was these things, these naturalists, these scientists who were studying them. And they're like, what in the world is this? If there's all the life on Earth has always been here, and nothing's ever gone extinct, and nothing's changed, then how do we explain these things that we're finding? Because they don't look like anything that's living today. So here's an example, right? And they call these things snake stones. Um, and they found like they found a bunch of them. Like, well, why? Why is it that they don't look like what we have today? And why is it that none of them ever have heads? And the reason being, not that you know this, because they weren't snakes at all. But again, the idea was that every living thing has always been this way. Nothing's gone extinct. Nothing's changed. Therefore, when you find fossils, then when you're in that mindset, this thing must still exist somewhere alive. So for them, it looked like a snake. Then there was discoveries in the early 1800s that were even more, I guess, uh, detailed than the snake stone, for example. Um, this thing is a great example, the ichthyosaur, it's a, which means fish lizard. So at this point, in the early 1800s, this is where people finally started to come around and say, okay, we've seen enough evidence. Possibly there were life forms that used to exist that no longer exist, right? So in the 1800s, that's when we first started coming around to that um, realization. So think about again, like dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, as we know, don't exist as we know when we look at the fossils. You're not going to see a T-Rex walking down the road. You'll see a bird, and birds are basically dinosaurs, that's a whole different discussion, but you're not going to see a T-Rex or a Velociraptor because they've gone extinct. Anyway, again, this is just a story, kind of a build-up to what we, what we knew then, building up to what we know now. So both of your textbooks talk about this guy named Lamarck. He was really close to nailing it. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. But naturalists, again, we talked about in the 1800s, naturalists were comparing the fossils that they were finding with living species. And they, obviously, they knew that they were different, right? So when you found a dinosaur fossil, a dinosaur skeleton, obviously, you can look at it and say, that thing is not alive anymore. There's no brontosaurus walking around. But again, like it says here, they were noticing. There were some similarities, like despite the fact that those organisms didn't exist anymore, they could look at it and say, wow, that thing is similar to birds in this way, or that thing is similar to reptiles in this way, right? They were noticing these things. And then in the early 1800s, there was this guy named Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, and he suggested the best explanation for the fact that they're finding these fossils that are different than living things, but still have similarities, was that life evolved. So I'm not going to necessarily ask you about him necessarily. I'll talk about that later. But I'm not necessarily going to ask you about him. But as far as we can tell, we're saying he's like one of the first people to suggest that life evolves. Just so you know. Now, here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. His idea that life evolves is obviously correct. His idea of how it happens, that's where he was incorrect, right? So he proposed that evolution is a refinement of traits that equip organisms to perform successfully in their environments. So, I don't know, well, I'll use the real example. So he thought giraffes' necks were long. He was, again, kind of correct, almost correct in this. So giraffes are stretching to eat, right? That's why they have long, they're stretching their necks because they're trying to eat the leaves off the trees. So he thought because they were stretching their necks that that would probably make them a little bit longer. Therefore, their offspring would have a little bit longer necks. And then those offspring would be stretching their necks, you know, their whole life. And then they'd have offspring, and therefore, their offspring would have slightly longer necks. So basically, he was saying if you used it, that that would get passed along, right? So this is before Mendel, or at least before anybody knew about Mendel. It was before we knew about genetics and about heredity. So right now, to us, that sounds silly, but at the time, that didn't sound silly. So Lamarck, for example, would think, and I'm not saying he thought this, but if you were alive today, and still thought the way he did. He might think if you're a guy or a person who works out all the time, right, you're really buff, maybe you have big biceps. In his mind, and then when you have offspring, especially if your spouse or your uh, partner also has big biceps, for example, then your kids are going to be born with slightly big biceps, right? So that's the Lamarckian proposal. And again, like I said, by using or not using body parts, an individual may develop certain traits, it passes on to the offspring. So we know, again, looking back, we know that's ridiculous. 
Because we know how genetics work, right? Because you just learned about that. You just learned about genetics. So we know it doesn't work that way. So again, his idea of how the species evolves was mistaken, but his idea that things evolve was that was correct. All right, so any questions about the mark? All right, there might be one question on the exam, and I think there's one on the study guide where it gives you some hypothetical situation. Like if this thing does this thing and the result is that thing, then that would be whose idea? And you would say, oh, it's Lamarck. Because the question will discuss, so it'll give an example of something using or not using a body part, and then that is passed along to uh, an individual. And again, that's not how it works, but at the time, that's what he thought. So any questions about Lamarck? All right, let's talk about the guy, the big guy, Charles Darwin. So. These are just some details. Um, again, this is not going to be tested. It's not a history class. I'm going to put a big old X to this before I talk about it. It's just giving you the story. So Charles Darwin was, ah, Charles Darwin was born in 1809. He happens to share the same birthday as uh, uh, Lincoln, like the same exact birthday, February 12th, 1809. Not that you didn't know that. It's a little trivia for you. He was fascinated with nature as a boy, so this isn't anything you know, wasn't knew for him what, what he eventually ended up doing wasn't new. Um, he started medical school, didn't like it. That was really found, found it really boring. And also surgery was horrifying because back in the day, you know, they didn't put you to sleep. So, you know, surgery was a lot different back then. He didn't like it. He also, and I love this part, he studied to be a clergyman at Cambridge, right? So a lot of people think there's this kind of separation between science and religion. It doesn't necessarily have to be. And again, he knew religion. Right? He studied to be a clergyman, so he had that background. Anyway, when he was 22, he started this journey um, on a ship called the HMS Beagle that was basically traveling the world from making maps. That was the purpose of it. And that's when his story really begins, as far as we're concerned. Uh, the next word for attendance, circle it, and we ship. And again, if you're watching the video later, not right now if you're live, but if you're watching the video later, take a picture of me pointing at the ship and sitting that end with the word ship. So again, this is still just an introduction. None of this is going to be on the exam. Let's talk about his journey. The Beagle, like I said earlier, was a survey ship, right? It was meant to chart, well, not just South American, but everywhere they went, they were charting, right? Trying to make maps. So. Obviously, like I said, they were all over the world, but when you're going all over the world, it's not like you can stay on the ship the whole time. Sometimes they stopped and they got off the boat. So when he did that, Darwin spent his time exploring. He was collecting fossils. He was also collecting living organisms, right, whether it be plants or animals. Um, he was keeping detailed journals of his observations. And he was noting characteristics of these plants and animals that made them well suited to their diverse environments. So again, he was going all over the world, so he was seeing all these different environments, right? And he was also seeing all these different organisms that were evolved. Of course, he didn't know that at the time, but they were evolved, right? They were well suited for their environments. Your book gets very specific. Um, like I said, he's collecting fossils and living plants. Your book talks about how, and I made a note here, your book specifically describes his observations of ground finches. So that'll be the next slide I'll show you. I'll just show you now. So your book talks about how he saw these different ground finches in the Galapagos Islands. and. You could tell, you know, based on what island they were, they had different beaks because they were in different environments. Because they, you know, some of them ate insects, some of them ate tiny little seeds, some of them ate big seeds, right? So for those different environments, you would have different beaks. So he collected those. Those are just an example. I'm not going to test you on them. Here's a little picture of where he's been. Not, again, not that I'm going to ask you. But again, like I said, or like I said, he saw all these different environments because he was in Great Britain and he went down the coast and saw all probably parts of Spain, maybe parts of Africa, South America, across the Pacific, um, in Australia, right? All these different environments. So he saw a lot of different environments, a lot of different organisms, and they were well suited for the environment that they were in. And again, for us, that's not a big deal because today we can go to a zoo or we can hop on the internet and just look at these things. But back in the day, that was not. Not as common, right? And it's really uncommon, even today, to physically go and see all these things, right? Like, I've not been to South America or Africa or Great Britain, right? But he went to all these places, saw them himself, 
And that's going to be important later. Not because I'm going to test you on it, but again, he's coming up with these ideas because he has a lot of experience in it. Um, he also went to the Galapagos Islands. I wish I had more time to talk about this. This is really important because the Galapagos Islands are relatively new, right? They are formed from volcanoes. Let me back it up. So here they are, right? Here's South America, and here's the Galapagos Islands. And again, this is really important. It'll be important later, not for testing, but to understand how this works. So again, the, the Galapagos Islands are new, relatively new. South America has been around for a long time. The Galapagos Islands have not been around as long as South America. They're new. They're volcanic islands. That's where they came from. So there's these things that lived on South America, and then, boom, the Galapagos Islands appeared. I mean, it didn't happen like that, but anyway. There eventually, or at first, there was no life on the Galapagos Islands. And it took a while, because look, South America is really far away from the Galapagos Islands. But it's important, and what's important about this is it's far enough away, the Galapagos Islands are far enough away from South America where life is not constantly going, right? You're not gonna get a lot of things going from South America to the Galapagos Islands. It's a long haul, right? It's far enough away where things are not constantly making that migration. However, it is close enough where it can occasionally happen. And that's going to be important later, because remember when we we're talking about um, allopatric speciation, right? When things were separated geographically, that's what's happened, right? So these things were occasionally able to leave South America. And once they got to the Galapagos Islands, for the most part, they were stuck there. And there wasn't a lot of things coming back in from South America to money the gene pool, so to speak. And we'll talk about that later. So all these species that originated in South America and got to the Galapagos Islands, they were now in a completely different environment than they used to be. So because of that, spoiler alert, over time, they evolved to take advantage of whatever situation they were in, as opposed to the situation they, they left in South America. That makes sense? So again, I'm not gonna test you on it, it's not important as far as the exam is concerned, but the idea of how this happened, this allopatric speciation, it is important, right, because again, the islands were far enough away to where there's not a constant exchange of genes, but also close enough where occasionally life did make its way from South America to those islands. Anyway, let's talk about his observations, at least start into it before we quit for the day. Um, his observations indicated that geographic proximity was a better predictor of relationships among organisms than similarity of environment. Meaning, again, looking back, he could say, all right, even though the environment on the west coast of South Africa is completely different than the environment on this island in the Galapagos, completely different environments, but the creatures I'm seeing are very similar, as opposed to, for example, the creatures he might have seen on a desert island of the Galapagos versus a desert part of Australia, right? Because he went in that area too. So he knew, he saw, again, this is groundbreaking at the time, he saw that when they were closer together, even if they had different environments, there were still some there were still some similarities there. And again, that was a big thing back in the day, because a lot of people were not traveling the world back then. And again, basically what I just said now, here it is in writing. Oh, well, in addition to what I said earlier, he was also found in fo finding fossils, right? So the South American fossils that he found, though clearly examples of species that were different from living ones, right? So they were clearly extinct species. They were still distinctly South American. He could tell by looking at these fossils that those things were just like, or very similar, very closely related to the living species uh, that are currently on the continent. So for example, and I took these pictures, I don't know where I got them, it's been a while. You probably recognize a lot of these animals, or at least think you do, right? So that probably looks like a llama to you, that probably looks like a toucan, that probably looks like a capybara, um, but they're not. Those are actually pictures of uh, animals that have gone extinct. But again, they look a lot like the animals that we know today because geographic proximity was so important. So again, Darwin was intrigued by the distribution of organisms on the Galapagos Islands. Like I've already said, uh, the Galapagos Islands are relatively young. Um, they're at that perfect little distance away from the coast, right, around 900 kilometers away, far enough away for life not to make it there all the time, but close enough where it happens occasionally. And again, the islands, or excuse me, some of the stuff you found on those islands, you can't find anywhere else on Earth. Because, again, they're in a very unique situation. They originated in South America, they came to these islands, and they evolved to take advantage of the uh, conditions they were in. 
I'm not going to ask you any of this either, so I'm going to go through it very quickly. This is also from your old textbook. Your new textbook doesn't even go into these details. But he noticed that Galapagos marine iguanas had flat tails that aided them in swimming, right? So again, he's comparing these iguanas on the Galapagos Islands to the ones that he saw in South America. He noticed that they were similar. Obviously, they, they're similar, but he also noticed that they're different. And again, these are the ways that they were different. They had these flat tails. So they were really good at swimming, right? So because again, those iguanas probably started on the mainland, somehow accidentally made it to the Galapagos Islands when there were different environmental conditions. So they evolved to take, uh, take advantage of it. And he also noticed that each island had its own distinct variety of giant tortoise. One of these things that I'm going to ask you. You download the PowerPoint and watch these videos about those things. There's a couple examples. Um, let's say the last word for attendance is turtle. And again, if you're watching the video later, you take a picture of me pointing at the turtle and send that in with a keyword turtle. And that's it for today. I'm going to try to get caught up in my email. You guys have a good week. And I'll see you on Wednesday. Or off that way. Thank you.